Professor Alan Dershowitz, joining me by way of Skype. Alan, I appreciate your uh, joining me. Uh, sorry to interrupt your uh, time with your family on the weekend, but I want to ask your reaction to the Department of Justice uh, release today that they are going to be looking at this as perhaps civil rights violations. Is that to answer the public pressure, or is there a good reason for them to be concerned about civil rights violations here? In general, the Justice Department does not investigate civil rights violations committed by one individual against another unless that individual works for the state or the federal government. A violation of civil rights usually involves the state, the government, violating someone's civil rights. George Zimmerman can't really alone violate the civil rights of an individual, even if he were to be guilty of the crime. Now, there ought to be a Justice Department investigation, but it ought to be focused on Prosecutor Corey in this case. She really violated civil rights in this case. What she did is she filed a false affidavit in front of the judge in order to get a second-degree murder charge. She failed to tell the judge that there were photographs and failed to show the photographs that demonstrated that Zimmerman's nose had been broken, that he had uh, uh, wounds in the back of his head. She misled the judge into giving her an overcharged second-degree murder charge against Zimmerman. That is a true violation of civil rights. And uh, the rest of the case is relatively routine. There was reasonable doubt written all over this case. To this day, nobody knows who, who struck the first blow. And that's already reasonable doubt. You nobody knows who yelled out, help me. Uh, nobody can be absolutely sure who was on top and who was on bottom, but the evidence overwhelmingly suggests that Trayvon Martin was on top and was banging the head of Zimmerman against concrete, thereby risking his life or certainly risking permanent injury. That doesn't sound like a civil rights violation. That sounds like a classic case of self-defense. And, Alan, the, the idea, you have said that you thought the prosecutor ought to be disbarred. That, that's Sorry. a pretty serious type of uh, uh, violation to get a person disbarred. It is that serious to you. Right, it, it is. Uh, she um, submitted an affidavit that was, if not perjurious, completely misleading. Uh, she violated all kinds of rules of the profession, and her conduct bordered on criminal conduct. She, by the way, has a horrible reputation in Florida. Uh, she's known for overcharging. She's known for being highly uh, political. And in this case, of course she overcharged. And halfway through the trial, she realized she wasn't going to get a second-degree murder uh, verdict, so she asked for a compromise verdict for manslaughter. And then she went even further and said that she was going to charge him with child abuse and felony murder. Uh, that was such a stretch that it goes beyond anything professionally responsible. She was among the most irresponsible prosecutors I've seen in 50 years of litigating cases. And believe me, I've seen good prosecutors, bad prosecutors, but rarely have I seen one as bad as uh, uh, this prosecutor, Corey. I have a feeling there's going to be some examples coming up in your law classes at Harvard involving this case. Uh, speaking of your law practice, You've dealt with a lot of high-profile celebrity clients. This case has brought such infamy uh, to George Zimmerman. If you were advising him how to start putting his life back together in the aftermath of what is this international publicity, what are some steps he needs to take to, to just have a semblance of, of normal life again? Well, I can tell you, I certainly advised Klaus von Bülow to disappear, and he went off to England, disappeared, and that served him very, very well. Uh, O.J. Simpson didn't do that. O.J. Simpson uh, forced himself onto the public that wasn't interested in seeing him at all. I would hope that George Zimmerman would uh, would disappear from, from view and just try to rebuild his life. As far as Prosecutor Corey is concerned, by the way, I would invite her to my class. Let her justify her conduct in front of my students. Uh, in fact, when I accused her of misconduct early in the case, uh, she uh, complained to the dean of the Harvard Law School and uh, asked that I be uh, disciplined for criticizing her. And just the other day, she fired one of her people because he blew the whistle on her misconduct. So she has engaged in this kind of tyrannical suppression of criticism against her. And, uh, you know, every American is in danger when we have prosecutors like her who don't obey the law, who follow political pressures. We're the only country in the world that elects prosecutors and elects judges. A case like this would never have been brought in any other country. 
they never even would have brought charges. It was such an obvious case of self-defense, and there was such obvious reasonable doubt. And the only reason this case ever came in front of a jury was because of the political pressures that were brought by groups of people who were dissatisfied with the first investigation and with the fact that a responsible prosecutor and a responsible police force decided that there was reasonable doubt and that the state could not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that George Dimmon did not engage in classic self-defense. Alan, it's always uh, insightful to hear from you, and I appreciate it very much. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you.